welcome to Live Action Star Wars Presents Data Link. I'm James. I'm Ralph. And today we are joined by a very special guest, uh, Mr. Samuel Victor. Uh, you may know him as uh, Blue 2 in Rogue One, uh, and he is also the author of the upcoming novel, Just Let the Girl Speak. There he is. Hello. Sam, thanks Hi. for joining us. Yeah, no, thank you for having me, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. You know, I I put I put the name of your character in our description, and I already forgot Torian. Tor no. Tori Torius Cord, uh, but the call sign is Torius. is blue too, so uh, that's easier to remember. <laughs> do you know where that Do you know where that name came from? Is that like a Pablo Hidalgo thing? Is it a? I don't. Um, to be honest, it, it was just one of those things that uh, the. I had a Reddit AMA recently where um, I wasn't aware there was going to be quite so much interest in this as there was because you know it's it's a it's a spin-off Star Wars movie. It's a long time ago, and it, I only had one line in the final edit. Um, and I put up this uh, AMA on Reddit, and it had three point one million views and <laughs> thousands of questions. And I was like, oh, okay, people are interested. Um, but I, I mentioned on there in in uh, more detail, but. Uh, yeah, essentially, I only came in for the reshoots on Rogue One, and um, the character had already been played by another actor who's far, far more more famous than me. I mean, I'm to give people an idea, I've, I've worked on over 60 movies. Uh, I've starred in quite a few films, um, and I would hazard a guess that almost nobody has seen any of them because they were all <laughs> very low budget, um, specifically for the UK DVD market. And what we used to do is produce very low budget movies for, like, fifteen thousand dollars equivalent and then sell a hundred thousand dvds to a wholesaler who would put them on the shelves of a supermarket for like a pound um <laughs> and, and, and you still and see them you still see them everywhere like those sorts yeah. of films yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, i i often see myself popping up in charity shops so i'll always be like post or pound shop dollar store, <laughs> that kind of thing. um but uh so i'm not a famous actor at all and um i just happen to be on the books as somebody who had auditioned for uh, The Force Awakens and not got in. Oh. Um, but obviously they had my measurements for, for costume and everything. Mm -hmm. And for the reshoots, there had been this character, Torius Cord, Blue 2, who is, a, as far as I can tell, a fairly significant part in the original version of the film. <laughs> um, but for whatever reason, that actor didn't come back for the reshoots. So I wouldn't want to um, speculate as to why uh, but I can tell you that actor was a heck of a lot more famous than me um, and that might explain why uh, my <laughs> reshoots didn't really get used um, <laughs> except for the one line which happened to be the one line that I improvised and turned out to be uh, pretty iconic and important for lots of reasons so well, I mean that's as you said like the reddit AMA getting that many views and questions mm. and stuff it just sort it of was... shows that Star Wars fans will will grab anything and it's and can turn one line into an entire character yeah. like as you said you you just had the one line it was a character name that sure was written for something a, a more substantial part but yeah. it yeah. doesn't matter because like going forward that could be expanded on in anything like and i i just come up with their own I definitely hoped that there would be novels or, or comic books or something that would expand on the character more, even if I'm nothing to do with it. And obviously with mm. Andor now, which is fantastic, and hopefully in Andor season two, which I believe uh, comes closer to the start of, of Rogue One, hopefully mm. the character will be in there. Now, I, I wouldn't assume for a second that it would be me who's playing it, although, you know, three million views on a Reddit may say there's interest. <laughs> <laughs> um, they still got your number and your measurements yeah. are still the oh, same. No, no, they definitely do. I've, I've been very lucky. I've, I've been in the entertainment industry um, well over two decades. I don't, I don't like to count how many years, since, since 97. Um, mm -hmm. And I've worked on and off for Disney in a freelance capacity for pretty much all that time in, in every different things, whether it's theme parks or Disney Channel or, or Disney Store or, or every, everything, the record labels, Hollywood, Hollywood records. Um, so I've got quite a good working relationship with Disney to a point. Um, but also, I'm not even trying to claim that I'm anybody important. And, and I'm yeah. certain that nobody at Lucasfilm would be specifically thinking of me, you know. <laughs> right. I don't know. Were I you think, a fan? I think, 
I think you'd be oh, surprised. Yeah. I'm sure that they look at they look at these Reddit threads and stuff. They see they see these things. Well, yeah. I, I hope so. I always worry um, about falling afoul of the Disney ninjas and and accidentally breaking right. an NDA or, or right. saying something yeah. that I shouldn't. I've been very very. Cl- this is why I, I skirted around talking about the character because obviously I know more about the character and about the background. But I, I if I even slightly mentioned it, I'd be blacklisted. Very least. In the official capacity, it's sort of not your place to say. I, I, th- I think uh, Ralph was asking me a minute ago, was, was I uh, a Star Wars fan? Uh, yeah, a yeah. lifelong Star Wars fan. Um, one of my earliest memories, like preschool, I would have been about four years old. Um, we were, we were. I mean, obviously, uh, UK, white, middle class, but, but, but we were relatively poor growing up. Um, and most of my clothes and most of my toys came from um, what in America they would call a rummage sale. Um, mm-hmm. And... Um, I, I just remember being about four years old and seeing a, a Kenner Star Wars, Star, uh, Star Wars Stormtrooper and having no idea what it was, but thinking it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. So I just kind of picked it up and it became one of my favorite toys. And, and in my head, it was a robot and it was a good guy. Um, but I just <laughs> loved it. Um, and then like relatively soon after, about the same age, um, I, I found... Um, Max uh, uh, Size Noodles and the Max Rebo Band. Amazing. Um, again, no idea what they were, um, <laughs> but just cool designs that really spoke to me. And, as, and as so they became, you know, my favorites. And they were playing with the secondhand broken Transformers and secondhand broken He-Man toys and everything else, you know. Um, mm. And then when I went to school, because um, I, I was, uh, uh, I'm a kid, kid of the 80s, so uh, I'm a little bit too... Uh, too young to have been able to see the original trilogy in the cinema Mm -hmm. um but uh, a friend of mine at school when i was maybe six or seven years old was obsessed with star wars so he told me all about star wars and about the characters and we used to play it at school then i went to his house and we watched all the movies and i just realized what my toys were Mm -hmm. um and became obsessed and then from that point on i was just on a hunt to get any Star Wars thing that I could find at these rummage sales and thrift stores um, and just watch the films over and over again on, on, on VHS till uh, literally till the tapes ran out, uh, like wore wow. out. Um, and of course, by the time that the prequels came out, I was what I was a teenager. So I was watching those in the cinema and that was amazing. And I played all the video games. Um, so as I said, the reason why they had me on the books was because uh, I auditioned for, force awakens and that was because i was in the film industry and working on like i say many 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 movies Mm -hmm. and knew a lot of people in in the industry and as soon as i heard that disney had bought (laughs) lucasfilm and we're going to make it i was just lobbying hard to be on that movie yeah and i was devastated because like 30 of my friends were stormtroopers in that movie and for some reason they did they didn't call me um and i lobbied to do anything you know be an extra be a runner be a t-boy you know hold hold a light stand anything just to get on set and and it didn't happen um but luckily they had my my details on file and i just coincidentally happened i guess to fit into the measurements of the guy that i was replacing right i want to i want to ask about that now yeah I've never worn a rebel flight suit. Okay. Was it a Cinderella moment? Like they said, oh. like, were you afraid you yeah. weren't going to fit? Like it was going to be too baggy or too tight or well, what was the, what was mm-hmm. that like jumping into that the first time? Knowing, knowing what, what, that you kind of had to fit. Yeah. The, when I, when I was there, it was, it was funny. Cause it, it was a rush. Obviously there's a lot of secrecy around this kind of thing. So I wasn't mm-hmm. told anything before I got there. I was literally just phoned up the night before and said, if you can get to Pinewood studios by seven o'clock tomorrow morning, um, you'll be in a star Wars movie. And that's all I knew. Yeah. And I was actually in Cardiff at the time, <laughs> which is a long way away uh, near the, near the doctor who studios in Wales. So a different country. Um, and uh, I had to run, literally run. Um, and I, also, I, was, I, I wasn't well off. I was working in McDonald's at the time. I was working on these mm-hmm. DVD movies during the yeah. day and working the night shift at McDonald's in the evening. And I literally was wearing my McDonald's uniform when I got the call from my agent saying, you've got to get to... <laughs> got to get to Pine. go 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 <laughs> yeah yeah so i was i ran to the i ran to the coach and to get the very last coach to london if i missed that there was no way for me to get there mm. um and 
I was I was traveling to set in my McDonald's uniform. And thankfully, on the way, um, I uh, passed because the Pinewood Studios is in Uxbridge, which is just outside of, of London. Um, I passed an Asda, which is like the British Walmart. Um, so I picked up a cheap like T-shirt and 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 sweat something so that, that wasn't your McDonald's something uniform. that wasn't a McDonald's <laughs> uniform yeah um but I assumed I was going to be an extra so I I just turned up and uh I followed all the other extras to the extras tent you have like a massive massive tent with just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people signing all the contracts and NDAs and everything um and then suddenly in comes this this woman with a clipboard looking very flustered and she was like Samuel Victor Samuel Victor Samuel Victor here uh, and I put my hand up and I was like, um, hello. And everyone looked at me like, who's this? And I'm like, I'm no one. Well, that, I don't know. Um, <laughs> All eyes but, on you. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and she was like, I am so sorry, Samuel. You've been sent to the wrong place. I'll get your assistant to drive you to your trailer. And I was like... What? <laughs> huh? what? Okay. Um, you, am I the right Samuel Victor? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. Um, so that was just bizarre. My mind was just going... Poof. Um, and they took me to, to the trailer, which, by the way, was right next to Felicity Jones's trailer. And we actually shared oh. the same kind of make makeup and hair touch up um, trailer and, and person. And I had like an assistant who on the little drive in the like golf cart to take me to my trailer was explaining what was going to be happening and <laughs> um, and apologizing for how last minute everything was and, and treating me like as if I was this really important actor. And I'm like dude you've no idea who i am but okay cool um and then do you want a happy meal i've got one of them <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 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 so so i was then you know left in my trailer which had you know posh you know drinks and bottles of wine and water and everything all laid out for me um a little kind of pack of bits of paper which was essentially a short script kind of explaining some of the scenes that i needed to know on a need to know basis um but also my costume was there, the flight suit hanging up. And then on the side, the trailer is like, if, if you can imagine like a posh caravan, if you were to go on holiday to like a, a, a uh, oh, what, what do you call it? Like, like a holiday park where, you, where you'd have like mm -hmm. um, uh, static caravans. Um, mm -hmm. And like on the side next to the kind of sink uh, uh, and the, under the TV was like a, a wooden... Uh, piece and I took pictures because I just couldn't believe it even though I wasn't allowed to take pictures and Disney got very angry at me for taking pictures um, and it had it the flight suit was hanging up in the wardrobe but then it had all the accessories including my helmet um, just just laid out and you yeah. know the chest the chest piece that's on here mm -hmm. like this and all the belts that clip around you because that none of that is attached to the flight suit you have to put it on separately um, and yeah just just looking at it and taking it all in and, and navigating that was was incredible and then actually putting on the clothes and standing there in in the kind of bathroom the bathroom had like a long mirror um <laughs> and i was completely by myself um and just looking at this and going oh my god i'm i'm a pilot in in a star wars movie and and realizing that okay i was annoyed that i wasn't a stormtrooper but if i'd have been a stormtrooper <laughs> then I, you wouldn't have Faceless. been able to see my face, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I was thinking there might actually be proof that I'm in this film and people might actually believe me. And then when I was looking at the piece of paper and starting to realize what, what the plot of the movie was and, and where it fell into the universe. And when, when I was growing up, like my favorite Star Wars movie was Empire Strikes Back. And I think most people agree it's, it's probably the best mm. of the, of the original trilogy. Right. Um, but I, I love, uh, star wars as we called it back then new hope episode four yeah. um my one problem as i got older as a as a kind of screenwriter and and director whatever with with a new hope if i was going to pick a hole in it was okay why does the death star have this essentially self-destruct button and how do the people who want to destroy the death star know about it if you were yeah. going to make this massive weapon why would you make it so That's easy to destroy yeah. Yeah. why would you make plans telling everybody how to destroy <laughs> it and how would it get into the yeah. hands of the very people you don't want to have it? So I, I always remember thinking, well, that's a bit convenient. It's very cool in a kind of video game, you know, the trench run yeah. it, it yeah. sense. It's, it's a very cool um, action set piece, but it doesn't make much sense from a plot standpoint. Or it didn't to me. Maybe some other Star Wars fans can can tell me more because they'll know more about it. But for me, I always thought, well, that's a bit of a that's a bit of a weakness. Um, but then sat there in the tray in my trailer and going, oh, my God, no, there's there's a reason for this. That's and the, the reason story. for it is actually it's, really doing, deep. Yeah. We're going to find out that essentially the person who designed 
the Death Star was essentially similar to the Nazi scientists of mm. not necessarily believing in the regime, but being forced to. Um, mm. And if they didn't develop, if he didn't develop this, then he would, you know, be killed or his family would, you know. So the fact that he put that in there as uh, as security to try and kind of make up for his deeds and that the more you think about that that that's really moving but but i mean everybody's seen the movie now so we know that but when i was sat there just by myself in the trailer putting on my costume for the first time just a few hours before i was expecting to start a shift running the drive through <laughs> yeah. overnight in in mcdonald and i was like and just learning all this information at once, I got really emotional and, and I, I, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I welled up and it was, it was a really strange uh, situation. Um, you just got thrust into your childhood. Like you, yeah, 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 yeah. You, yeah, you yeah. got put into a timeline mm. and, like in and a, in getting a, to know information about Star Wars that nobody else well. knows. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, and, and for me, I mean, I know I'm biased, um, but for me, out of all the Disney star wars movies um rogue one is probably the best and certainly the most resonant um mm. and and the most important from uh joining the narrative of of the prequels to mm. the original trilogy um and also i i believe with without um rogue one um because of the excellent work done by both gareth edwards and tony gilroy both of whom i've, I've worked with on on separate occasions and i have enormous amount of respect for both of them um possibly because of their uh, influence. Um, I don't think without Rogue One, I don't think we'd have Mandalorian. I don't think we'd have, well, we certainly wouldn't mm -hmm. have Andor, but any of these series uh, that are coming out yeah. now, which are more kind of slow and plot based and character based mm. and not necessarily so it, much this is a roller coaster theme park ride this happens yeah. and this happens and this happens and this happens which it is essentially episode eight episode nine stories yeah definitely yeah definitely. yeah um, people, we, people we, love every yeah a lot of people love rogue one i love rogue one mm. um and i feel like a lot of people may forget at the time we only had force awakens like it, yeah. we had this yeah. Star Wars movies were mm -hmm. one thing and they yeah. fit a specific uh mold. Yeah. And Rogue yeah, yeah, yeah. One it, you it know broke it from the opening moment like that it, opening shot. It was shot, it was like, Disney's yeah. way of showing everybody like Star Wars doesn't have to be just this. Yes. It could be shot handheld. It doesn't need yeah. to have the crawl. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. need to have John yeah. Williams. Yeah. It could be it doesn't yeah. have to have be about Jedi. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be, you know, it it but uh, with John Knoll sort of creating this story and picking this time frame, it yeah. gave the audience at least something familiar. Set it yeah. in a time yeah, yeah. frame where it's like well, let's get, it's still Star Wars, but yeah. there's there, we're not dealing with Jedi and stuff. And yeah, we we will get a glimpse of Darth Vader, but he was around at the time, so that makes sense. But it, it was it was a really nice way to sort of be like Star Wars doesn't have to be this sort of camera locked down, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's it's yeah. It was very my cin cin cinema verite, the... shaky cam. Um, yeah, but at the same time, the but but often kind of shaky cam uh, can be associated with with low budget movies and found footage yeah. and things like this and, and, like, and yeah. indie films and and it often means I... that that it's an excuse to not really have proper cinematography and uh, but that's absolutely not the case with Rogue One. It's fantastically shot. It, yeah. they, uh, the I think DOPs it's the best looking Star Wars movie ever. I agree. Yeah. My, I, I agree. I agree. Absolutely. I feel like yeah. I, a, a lot of people will give uh, sort of the argument for Last Jedi being the most beautiful Star Wars. I think it's a very mm. good looking film. Mm. Um, but I feel like the way Gareth Edwards shot Rogue One, yeah, every set had to be looked had to look right from every angle because yes. you didn't yeah. know where it was going to shoot. I feel like I feel like um, the Last Jedi, which I like, it's um, it looks like friend. a play. It's, it's, it's like everything yeah. everything is set up just so. Yeah. So with Rogue One being handheld, like I love being able to see it from every angle and I was... in the scene. I'm sorry. In the scene that you did, it's great because yeah. he can get a lot of coverage of yeah. every angle. Yeah. I was yeah. looking for for thumbnail art with you in it, and everything cuts so quickly mm. yeah. in that boardroom yeah. scene. But what's great about it is is it's like first it's a little tough to find you. I know I started like knowing where to look for you, yeah. and then um, but but just the fact that. 
that room was just filled with people and it was shot from every angle and but that's it. Like, you feel like you can move so around it and lived in. you felt like you were in there yeah yeah, um, yeah yeah what was it like being in there oh uh, it, it well it, i mean it, it was it was cr crazy um obviously um but just just to, to pick up from your point from what you said um the staging of that film uh, of that scene um we basically shot the same thing obviously multiple times from different angles but but Tw twice in the reshoots and in the first lot um i was actually in the front row at the table stood mm -hmm. basically right. it was me felicity and um oh i've, I've forgotten his name but but fan fantastic actor uh in, in in the middle i've just gone blank um and i'll remember as soon as this call ends um but it, it <laughs> literally I, I was right there um and there's some fantastic publicity shots and uh in a lot of the official um, D uh, Disney and, and Star Wars books and collector's cards and things like that. Those are the pictures you see because you can see me a lot clearer. Mm -hmm. um, then they, I think basically once they decided they were going to use my line, they then reshuffled everybody around and placed me behind Felicity as part of the group instead. Um and then that gave them choice in the edit. So whereas yeah. originally I was playing Taurus Cord Blue 2, who had an established kind of story arc to a point, um, and I believe was fe featured more in, in the Battle of Scarif, but that's, that's pretty much all I should say. Um, then if they decided to chop all of that out completely, which they did in the end, um, they still had me saying that line, which they had decided was important. And I agree. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, from being just a random person in the crowd. And although I would love it if, yeah, there's me mm. saying the line there. Um, <laughs> and although um, I would love it if you could actively see me right in, in the front, that close to Felicity saying the line in the movie, yeah. it actually, from a narrative perspective, is more impactful that it's a voice coming from the crowd because for me yeah. that crowd is essentially uh pilots who have no status as far as um wouldn't be able to tell the politicians what to do and wouldn't be able to tell the business leaders what to do and um it's the voice of the people it's, it's the, yeah it's yeah. the voice of the people and i think some people i, I get asked sometimes why did i say because obviously um, it got turned into to quite a big kind of uh, feminist uh, narrative, which is let the girl speak, turned into like a really big meme. There started being unofficial merchandise produced, which was nothing to do with me, by the way. Um, but pe <laughs> people using it during the Me Too movements and everything else. And uh, I've always used my uh, used any money that I've made from any promotions that I've been asked to do, Comic Cons, etc., to give to women's charities and helping more women uh, get into film. Because that's something I am very passionate about because a lot of my female friends and colleagues and, and even partners have, have had issues over the years um, due to the lack of representation, meaning it's a bit of a boys club, which, which can cause problems yeah. to an extent. Um, so uh, I actually thought people have said, why did you say, just let the girl speak? Isn't girl infantilizing or isn't girl, you know, not respecting her. And I'm like, no, that's the point. Th mm. Think about it. These guys are essentially military guys who are, and again, without wanting to stereotype, but but you often within those kind of in the trenches, barracks of men, you know, having to fight for their lives, they might die at any minute. Um, it becomes very kind of masculine energy, you yeah. know. Um, mm -hmm. So there was even less likelihood that this, you know, comparatively small, petite, beautiful young woman comes in and starts bossing them around and telling them what to do. So for me, just let the girl speak was he was showing her respect whilst at the same time appealing to everybody around him of like, yeah, I know that, I know that it seems ridiculous, but maybe we should listen to her, you know? And it sort of comes at a moment where everyone is shouting and arguing over mm, each exactly, other as yeah, well. Yeah. So like, it is exactly that. It's that masculine energy, like of everyone just trying to get their point. And it's like, I'm not trying yeah. to get my point across. Let her let speak. Yeah. Let her, let her speak. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah. to yeah. answer your question about what, what was it like being there? Um, from a fan perspective, it was 
just incredible, extremely emotional. I'd already basically had a breakdown in my trailer and just been like, I can't believe this is happening. And then it was literally like every five minutes of, of being on set, because as I said, I did other scenes as well, which I can't really talk about. But but every everywhere that mm -hmm. I was, I would just be seeing something new. Like every, every five minutes or something, somebody would pass or whatever, and there would be a new weapon or a new droid that were because they, they were actual physical droids, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, all the Mon, Cal Mon Calamari were all actual animatronic kind of Henson style puppets and things. So, it, or I'd be walking past a cockpit of a of a vehicle, like the cockpit set of a vehicle, or uh, the outside of a vehicle, and I was just. And I actually saw, you know, things that I'd never seen before. Like uh, I remember seeing a U-wing and going, "What? On uh, earth what's is this? that?" Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, so for a Star Wars fan, it was incredible. Mm. Um, it, it certainly wasn't my first time on set of a big blockbuster movie. I'd, I've worked on many, many uh, big blockbuster movies, um, mostly as an extra or a runner or, or a grip or whatever. Um, and it wasn't my first time having, you know, lines in a film. Like I said, I've starred in movies, but Star Wars is just different. It, yeah. You know, it's it's, yeah. it's it's just different, especially for somebody like me who's just got such a deep connection to it. And 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 I've got, uh, you know, I've uh, I've got kids, and and um, two two of my kind of biggest like happiest memories with with, with my kids that kind of I felt kind of tied us together uh, in a way was. Um, when we first took them to uh, Disneyland Paris and, and I took them on uh, Star Tours for the first time, which if you haven't been on it, is essentially like walking onto the walking into Star yeah. into the Star Wars universe. You know, you're, you're right there with, you know, life size, uh, uh, you know, life size vehicles and fully moving droids that interact with you and, and everything else. It, incredible. Um, obviously not a patch on Galaxy's Edge, but you're you talking uh, before then, but but still Star Tours, incredible. Um, mm -hmm. And But seeing them as young children who didn't really know very much about Star Wars other than, oh, this is something that dad likes and he's got a few toys of or a few little... Uh, but then seeing them walk into it and just fall in love with it and they yeah. came out of that being, we are Star Wars fans now. <laughs> and they wanted... They they both wanted you know toy lightsabers and they was wanted, this before um, or after you were in Rogue oh one? B b before yeah oh, like, wow. before like, when, when they were quite so young. after that you just became I'm guessing like yeah well uh, sort of in their eyes. yeah then there was then there was Force Awakens and I remember telling them hey they're making a Star Wars they're making a brand new Star Wars movie mm -hmm. in the UK and I'm trying to work on it and lots of my friends are working on it and they were super excited <laughs> obviously and then just like yeah. me they were super annoyed when when <laughs> when it didn't happen. Um, but again, the, the second kind of big memory that, that I have from an emotional standpoint is taking them to the cinema to see uh, Force Awakens on a preview screening mm -hmm. um, just before opening night. And again, just being full of S Star Wars fans. But but the reaction of them coming out of that, uh, my youngest was actually speechless. I was like, when we came out of that, I was like, so what did you think? Did you like it? And they just, <laughs> just literally couldn't speak for about 10 minutes. Amazing. And I was like, amazing. Yeah, that's that. That's that's how I used to feel about this. Yeah. So then, just you know, eighteen months or so later, to be able to take them again to the cinema and you know see, see their you. dad on screen, you know that that was pretty cool. <laughs> that's cool. Um, but for also, you mentioned the fact that the 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 shaky cam and the cinema verite kind of style that that uh, Gareth Edwards was was using um, allowed it meant that you could see so much more of the sets. Yeah, I, I was because I was so fascinated with everything and from a filmmaking perspective, I was just going up to everybody, every crew member I could uh, get up to and speaking to them and asking them questions and seeing who would tell me what. Um, and I managed to talk to a good few of the uh, production designers and the people who'd made the props and, and the set dresses and everything. A um, couple of whom I, I, I mentioned by name um, in, in, in the Reddit thread and gave more details about what they said. But uh, um, yeah, they, they basically explained, yeah, this isn't just having to recreate the old sets as it would have been um, in Pinewood back in the day for, you know, A New Hope, etc. in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, they had to go into so much more detail. Firstly, because the they were shooting on... Um, it was Alexa. I think it was the. I can't remember which Alexa, but it was the equivalent of a of a 65, 70, 70 millimeter, oh. um, but Alexa oh. digital camera, uh, which was actually shooting in I think six and a half, seven, six and a half K, something like six point four K. Um, so the the detail that it could potentially pick up yeah. was was much higher. So in the older films, like the further back you go, 
the costumes get less and less uh, they're not, they don't need and, to be detailed back Yeah, and, and yeah, the people in the back are just holding bits of dowel wood or whatever <laughs> instead of lightsabers. Um, yeah. uh, and, and they still did that to an extent, but they couldn't get away with as much. Um, but also, uh, because the camera could be pointing in any direction, they had to yeah. basically make the sets 360 degrees. So it, it was you actually had to live in it rather than just having let's make a wall or let's make a, a, a two wall corner backdrop or something, which most films yeah. would do and they it, wouldn't bother It's me. totally immersive, it right? Is, it's it's like, funny, isn't it? How mm. like all the stuff with the stagecraft and uh, the volume and everything, everyone like we've heard yeah. about all that with the Mandalorian and stuff. And then when Andor came out, everyone was like really happy that it's physical sets and it's real locations again. And yeah, it's kind of the same, like it's the weird connection back to Rogue One with this, yeah. where it's that same thing. It's like you could walk into a Rogue One set and it wasn't just that backdrop over there. It was, as you were explaining, the whole yeah. thing yeah. is very, very well, cool. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly, uh, I'm fairly well, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I'm, I'm fairly well versed in, in visual effects. I've been, that's mm -hmm. one of the main things I've been specializing in since, since 2014, I've been training up. And uh, part of that has been working mostly uncredited because this is the way the industry works. Uh, you get hired as freelance by a company and they credit the company rather than the person. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But when any of the main visual effects houses on a blockbuster are running out of time or running out of budget, which as we've seen in the news is, is happening a lot with, you know, things like Marvel and DC movies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, quite often at the last minute, people like me will get called in to do remote work of saying, Hey, can you just finish this shot? Or can you just mm. do this bit of rotoscoping for the green screen or, or whatever, you know? So um, visual effects is something that I know a fair amount about. And, and um, because of a, well, I say a chance meeting, but I, I briefly studied with um, Paul Franklin, who's multiple Oscar winning visual effects, special mm. uh, supervisor, who is also the head of, of D neg double negative, who does, you know, yeah. maybe 50% of the visual effects yeah, on almost any blockbuster. Um, and um, he, he's incredible. And uh, he won visual effects uh, uh, Oscars for the Dark Knight trilogy, Inception, Interstellar. So just, just to give you an idea. Um, he genius, by the way, obviously, um, but also a lovely guy. And he was giving me all, all these tips. And this was back in, in 2014, 2015, um, which, as I said, my I was work, working at McDonald's in the evening and working on movies during the day. And, and the reason for that was because we used to do really well making these little low budget DVD movies. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could make a very decent living by doing that and have great fun and make connections and meet famous people and go to premieres. It, it was lovely. Um, but of course, then with broadband internet in the UK starting to take off, people started pirating movies more. Um, and then when kind of Netflix and other streaming services started to come in, just literally nobody bought budget DVDs anymore. So yeah. the, the bottom fell out of the market. Uh, so my friends and I decided, OK, let's bandy together and put all of our money into making higher concept, higher budget movies and try and sell them to a worldwide market. Um, one of the first of which um, that Star Wars fans might have at least vaguely heard of is a film called The Last Scout, which was released in America, which is a, like a sci-fi movie um, set in space and, you know, visual effects, explosions, spaceships, etc. Um, <laughs> very low budget compared to Star Wars, but way more ambitious than anything that I'd previously produced. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that meant that we we literally were putting all our eggs in one basket um, and I spent everything I had, you know, sold my car, um, moved into a smaller house, everything. Um, and um, but I thought, no, I, I need to take this seriously and I need to learn visual effects and be able to make kind of more kind of mockbuster or style movies yeah. that I can sell for more. And um, Paul Franklin uh, basically said to me, well, do you know about this guy, Gareth Edwards? And I said, oh, I've. Yeah, I've heard of him because we're in similar circles because he's been doing some visual effects for the he's BBC doing his own free, stuff. freelance and I've been doing that as well. Um, and um, he said, well, you want to do what he's doing because he made a very yeah. low budget movie that Monsters. he shot himself yeah. uh, called Monsters. Monsters. Um, but, but he did all the visual effects himself um, and then he sold it to a major distributor for like a million dollars up front. Mm. And because they made a profit, the very next film that he directed was Godzilla 2014, which is like 60 yeah. million budget. Yeah. And then, uh, His and trajectory then, right, is nuts. <laughs> yeah. And, and then they said, uh, and then he said to me, have you heard that now he's directing a star Wars movie? And at the time I hadn't heard that because it was, I don't think it had been made public. Mm. And I went, what? He's doing a star Wars movie. Not knowing that like a year and a bit later, I'd be working with him on a star Wars movie. Um, yeah. 
But uh, he said, you know, you want to follow that trajectory. Mm. Um, so literally from that point on, I was like, OK, I'm going to make like a big budget uh, style movie. And I, I wrote a script for a superhero um, movie that roughly was autobiographical and kind of, you know, kind of a self insert of, OK, what what do what can I write about myself and my own journey and my own self-improvement? Because I, like I say, with the whole just let the girls speak and speaking up for women, I don't claim to be. Um, some perfect advocate for exactly how you should. <laughs> right. No, when I was a teenager and in my early twenties, I did things that I completely cringe about, and I was it's this horrible little toxic sexist guy who who thought he was the most important person in the world because he was in the music <laughs> industry and the film industry. You know? um, and I've, I, it's having kids and and uh, you know various you know women that I've I've been with and been around over the years that have just made me improve myself so much and yeah. I'm, I'm always on a constant journey, journey to improve myself said, yeah. and, and yeah. It, I, I think everybody is it's, it's a constant journey of self-improvement um but uh i just thought well i at the at the time, there was a lot of it, a lot of my friends, a lot of my friends and some of my family are trans, um, mm -hmm. either male to female or, or female to male, whatever. Um, and also a lot of obviously in the in the industry, a lot of my friends are, are, are gay um, and have different gender identities and things like this. Um, and at the time, there was a lot of there, there was the rise of things like the incel movement, the MGTOW movement, um, Jordan Peterson and nowadays the Andrew Tate. And I'm not equating all of those things together and i'm not saying that they're all as bad as each other and i'm not saying that some of them don't make some valid points but there's always a toxic element to mm. some of the people who gravitate towards those things and i thought well if i'm going to be making a superhero movie every every blockbuster action movie has what they call the hero's journey of some sorts and, and star yeah. wars is, is a perfect example yeah and i and basically you always have a character with with a, a want and a need uh, and what they think they want is not necessarily what they actually need from an emotional standpoint mm. and this is why like you might get a sports movie where the sports team thinks they want to win right but then mm -hmm. at the end of the movie they don't actually win it's, the, but it's, it's still a happy ending because the, like that's not what they really needed they needed an emotional journey they needed to learn something about themselves they needed to reconnect with their parents they needed it's the friends we made along the way sort of friends like, we made along the way exactly yeah. that yeah. Yeah, so I th so I thought, okay, well, I'll write this very simple little script. I mean, sub, I was going to say sub Deadpool, but even sub Kickass as far as budget <laughs> goes. I was like, really simple, low budget superhero movie about a male superhero movie who uh, about a male superhero who became this who became a superhero for the wrong reasons because he's mm -hmm. got these ideas about toxic masculinity and he wants to uh, you know be. <laughs> Um, he, he wants to be a real man and he thinks that if he does good deeds, then people will like him and he'll be popular. So I, I wrote this. I wrote this script. Um, sorry, I can see you're trying to talk. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to have to cut you off. I've just got to go. I'm yeah, going to try and yeah. jump onto my phone and just carry on watching. Yeah, James already told me he has to leave early. That's fine. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 please carry on. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. And yeah, thanks for joining us. Sam. Yeah, no, yeah. no worries. Lovely to speak to you. Thank you for having <laughs> yeah, me on, James. All right, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so I, I, I wrote this this uh, su superhero movie, very simple little low budget thing that was meant to just be about almost kind of paralleling my journey of, you know, uh, of learning to accept myself and be a better person, you know, but turn it into a superhero story. Mm -hmm. And I thought that might be helpful for young boys watching it. Um, and along the way, we'd have a few cool visual effects and set pieces that we could put into the trailer and make it look exciting. Um, but then because of star wars and because of various other things and and me knowing a lot of people who are based in pinewood studios pinewood has maybe 200 businesses that are actually permanently based there like including distributors mm -hmm. and visual effects houses and things um i just somehow this little script that i wrote ended up getting seen by people at marvel and people at dc and people oh. at fox and paramount and sony and everybody was getting <laughs> well not everybody but a lot of people were getting back to me saying hey we think this could be turned into like an actual blockbuster with an actual budget. And um, over, then from 2014 to, to 2019, over like a five year period, I basically had the creme de la creme, cream of the crop of the industry, just helping me to turn this into a much bigger uh, film, plan it to potentially be a franchise, have spin-offs, have prequels, have sequels, have comic books and video games. And, um, and that's fantastic for me because I can use the whole kind of just let the girls speak, you know, um, 
giving voices to people who wouldn't otherwise have them to go, okay, well, we can make a, a film about a, a female superhero that is written by a female writer and directed by a female director and produced by female producers, female cinematographers. And yeah, it'll just happen to be in my universe and my character will briefly turn up like MCU style and we'll put in an extra credit, <laughs> end of credit scene. But I can use the the good momentum that i'm getting to help other people and the same for you know people of color or or anybody who with an underrepresented voice they can have their own superheroes that will fit into that ethos um so because of the, the uh, because of all of that like i said i've just become more and more and more entrenched in in visual effects and practicing doing visual effects on other big blockbusters and and meeting other people who are doing uh, visual effects for big blockbusters and hopefully courting them to work on my movie. Um, <laughs> right. So it, it gave me a whole new perspective of just exactly how impressive everything on Rogue One was because they weren't just shooting everything on a green screen, which the majority of me, right. I mean, if you look at behind the scenes of Marvel movies and stuff, I'm not insulting it, it's, it's incredible, mm -hmm. but they are literally on a massive green screen. They aren't on the streets of New York because that's too expensive right. or whatever, you know, or too dangerous. Um, yeah, I just watched, uh, I just saw Ant-Man and the Wasp, yeah, the Quantumania, Quantumania, and that's like, yeah. gotta be 95% green screen. I, I, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and so there's nothing now, wrong with that, but I, I no, tend to feel no. that if, and, and certainly my own, my own superhero stuff, especially the early films, which will be lower budget, will be essentially just like that. It'll be 95% green screen and it could be shot in pretty much whatever country will give the best tax breaks or whatever studio is free right. at the time. Um, but when you do have the extra budget, if you can shoot as much as you can practically, I mean, even if you're going to have a massive CGI explosion, have a small controlled real life explosion just like a firework going off or something so that you get the real reaction from the actors and mm. you get real light hitting them and it makes them jump yeah. at the same time and it reflects in their eyeballs and then use the cgi to make it better and we we saw that with um with rogue one but also with the the sequel uh trilogy things like uh bb8 um you know there'll mm -hmm. be a human being yeah. pushing him on a stick yeah. which you can remove in CGI, but the actual robot itself, the actual droid itself, sorry, uh, is is entirely practical and the actors robots. Can, can work with it. Yeah, I know. Sorry, sorry. I believe, I want to say, I want to say in, in Star Wars, Luke mm. calls them robots or maybe mm. uh, these are the same guys that sold us the robots. These are the same Jawas that sold. There is, they do say robots in, well, yeah. in A New Hope. So, they do. So. I don't and think I, you have I, to worry. <laughs> I've been I've been lucky enough to uh, be around Mark Hamill on on various occasions on mostly low budget indie stuff and and also you know, conventions and stuff. And he's just an amazing guy, as lovely as you'd want him to be. But he he regularly refers to C three PO as a robot, um, and nobody corrects him because it, it's Mark Hamill. Why would yeah. you? You know. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, yeah, no. So yeah, the the more that you can do practically, the better. Um, but also just to say, I'm not saying that films that don't do that and do everything in, in green screen are bad because yeah. that would be very Cause, hypocritical because that's exactly what I'm doing I, myself. Cause I mean, there's <laughs> things going on in, in, in Mandalorian where it's like, they're using the volume and they're using visual effects to create like landscapes mm. and stuff. And then you have yeah. like Andor, um, as long as the storytelling's good. Yeah, of course. The effects yeah. don't matter. That's the um, most important thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. It's 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 really funny how um, there's a lot of folks that really like champion uh, practical effects, practical stuff, and yeah. it's like for me, it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. I love I love looking at CG. I love looking at practicals as long as the story is telling good and I'm not distracted by either of them. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. A lot of people don't notice CGI until it's bad. Um, I mean, there's obviously right. certain things that you go, well, that would have been impossible or too dangerous to shoot. So it was probably CGI. But if the CGI is good, yeah. you can't tell. It's like, um, as I said, I, I know a lot of people within the MCU system and um, a lot of the movies, there will be maybe five visual effects shots from each movie that people will pick out and say, look how terrible this is. Look at and look how lazy Marvel are. And they'll laugh at it. Um, and it's it's. Like there are five visual effects shots out of 600 
visual effects shots that people have picked up on that aren't as good. And yeah. um, there's always at least 10 different companies making the visual effects. And as I said, sometimes it's even farmed out to, you know, amateurs like me at the last minute who just to get one shot done so that it gets done in time or gets done in within budget. Um, and I, I, Black Widow is a good example of, of I, I, I happen to think that from a from a screenwriting perspective and from a character development perspective, um, Black Widow is actually certainly within the top three uh, movies in the MCU. And that mm. doesn't mean it's a that doesn't mean it's a fan favorite. But that means that yeah. from an actual storytelling perspective, getting the characters right, showing the relationships, having um, a journey for all of them. Fantastic. I mean, you could argue about what they did with Taskmaster and everything, but that's that's more of a, <laughs> a semantics on the comics rather than on a movie itself. Um, yeah. But it's it's written brilliantly. It's acted brilliantly. Everybody in it is incredible. Scarlett Johansson and, and um, um, uh, David, uh, what's his Pugh. name? I can't remember. And Florence Pugh, Harbor, obviously, is perfect yeah. in everything. Yeah, David Harbour, yeah, uh, who's amazing in everything. Um, it, it's just, it, it's exquisitely done. And there's one particular shot that people pick up on um, and say, look how terrible this looks. And it's always being posted and it became a meme. Yeah. Um, and I know for, for, for a fact that that shot was one of the very last shots done because they reshot those that particular shot for story reasons so they made the visual effect worse to make the story stronger and to make the story better the reason why it looks hokey and on a green screen is because it is hokey and on a green screen they called in scarlett johansson at the last minute and just got her to shoot in some random studio in la that you can rent for 75 dollars an hour and just right. put a fan in front of her and you know hired her for an hour and and shot that because it was important to the plot and it was important to making the plot work better. And for me, that's the right decision. Um, as mm -hmm. you say, the story and the plot is bet is more important than making everything look 100% picture perfect. Because chances... we're talking about things that don't exist in real life anyway. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, chances are that uh, that shot, you know, the majority of the people didn't even really notice. It probably went by so fast. But yeah. then you get one person it's like two seconds, three sort seconds. of to, to like screenshot it. And then yeah. everybody piles on mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's it's yeah. it's a little bit uh, Star yeah. Wars fans tend to do that, too. I know like yeah. people complain about like Jar Jar and stuff. And it's like they're whether there's issues in episode one or not, it shouldn't all be pinned on Jar Jar. Um, no. But that's the one thing that once people pick on it, everyone else uses that as an example and just piles yeah. up and becomes this big thing. Um which is why I'm so glad that Rogue One, I feel like, came out pretty unscathed as far as, far as Star Wars fans go. Like, I feel yeah. like the majority of Star Wars fans like Rogue One. Um, it, and I think it's only it's getting stronger with multiple viewings. It, it, it's interesting because I've, um, I've been lucky enough to be able to kind of use this kind of well, I was going to say 15 minutes of fame. It's like two seconds of fame. But because the line yeah. became became a meme and became important to people and even became a part of people's everyday lives. So I get people coming up to me all the time telling me that they shout, just let the girl speak at their at their son, at their, yeah. <laughs> you know, at their, at their boyfriend, at their husband. Um, even so even just as a joke. So becoming like part of somebody's life in that way is, is just mind blowing to me. Um, yeah. But it's um I've been lucky enough to be invited to many, many different events that are tangential to Star Wars, such as, you know, toy launches in, in Hamleys or doing Force for Change events or a celebrity marathon in, in Disneyland Paris or screening of The Last Jedi in, in Disney World, um, uh, the Legends of the Force um, seasons in Walt Disney Studios, all kinds of stuff. And, mm. um, and of course, lots of Comic-Cons. Um, I'm also um, a, a video game producer and, and involved in, in the retro game community. So I often go to gaming uh, um, conventions as well. Um, and of course, there's a lot of crossover. So a lot of people want to talk to me about Star Wars. And um, what I've learned over the years is that the more hardcore a Star Wars fan somebody. Now, I'm going to trigger somebody by saying this because you, yeah, you always sure. can do. So I, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not I don't want to generalize. Um, and I'm not talking about you specifically, but um yeah, the the in overall, the more kind of hardcore a Star Wars fan somebody is, the more that they really appreciate Rogue One, and the more that they really like it, um, and the more that maybe they dislike either 
Last Jedi or uh, Rise of Skywalker, depending on their opinions on certain things. Yeah. Um, and this is what people tell me. And they're always like, oh, you're in the only good Disney Star Wars movie. And I certainly wouldn't wouldn't agree with that. I think all of them are good no. in their own way. All no. of them have flaws in their own way, but I've, all of them I've, are good in their own way. Since this show has be begun, um, I have touted that Solo. Mm. is actually my favorite Disney era Star Wars movie. Well, so it's another Rogue anthology One, film and it's it's good for it's, the same reason that, that Rogue I think One it's is good. good. I think it's good because Star Wars has been around for 46 years. Mm. And with that has come this sort of um this intense fandom and um you kind of hold it very it's very precious. Star Wars is very precious to a lot of people. It's mm -hmm. precious to me. I love Star Wars. Of course, yeah. And because like the Star Wars stories, the your Rogue One and Solo sort mm -hmm. of fit in their own little separate corner from the Skywalker saga. Yeah. That you don't have to feel as precious about it. So yeah. I don't feel like it gets scrutinized as much as mm -hmm. say what they did to their favorite character, Luke Skywalker. Uh, Rogue One yeah. is like, there's like Mon Mothma, Bail Organa, and then yeah, 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 maybe a yeah. couple of backgrounds. So you're not really messing with and anybody's Leia at the end. favorite characters. <laughs> so like, if you look at, yeah, and Leia. But, but well, I mean. Uh, She's bad yeah. in it, but yeah. <laughs> but, but the thing is you have like, what I think is one of the successes of and or the series. Yeah. Is that it's, it's, like Cassian is a new character uh, other than like Mon Moth Mothma and Bail Organa. Is he even in it? He's not in it, is he? Um, no, I don't. No, I don't. Think um, so. you, you, you're not really messing with precious characters. Like when Book of Boba Fett came out, yeah. people had this idea of who that character was and yeah. got very vocal about it not meshing up with their ideals. So yeah. I think what's great about Rogue One and Solo, even though Solo's messing with Han Solo, like probably the most yeah. iconic character it, from yeah. the series, well, but it's still like it's yeah. <laughs> it's still it's still just it's a it's a side adventure. It's not it's it's yeah. not held up to this pedestal. And the thing I like mm. is like both those films have uh music by Michael Giacchino, yeah. music by John Powell. Um oh, sure. And it's nice to be able to be like, you know what? It's nice to have a Star Wars that's kind of just a little bit off to the side with dealing with characters that aren't named yeah. Skywalker. And I, I that's one of my favorite things about Rogue One is I could pop it in mm. and have no sort of preconceived notion of any of the characters. Um, yeah, I definitely nice... agree. But but as opposed to solo, as opposed to solo, although again, I'm sure people could, could correct me and, and have opinions, but. In a way, for me, uh, because it's so so ties up the prequel trilogy and the original trilogy. For me, mm -hmm. Rogue One is a part of the Skywalker saga. Oh yeah, really. If if you want the full picture, um, I mean, we it, have it, we have the droids in it. We have C three PO and R two D two who yeah. are like. Yeah. The, the the main overarching characters of all like and if it wasn't movies. if it wasn't for some very important character telling them to let the girl speak then, then <laughs> arguably episodes four to nine may never have happened and everybody might have just been dead and the planets would have been all the moons would have just been destroyed you know <laughs> yeah so we 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 haven't touched on this yet and uh, Rick Dement asks um, was the book an idea you came up with it or was it pitched to you um and. Let's get into I, the book. I, I, as part of the, uh, sorry, what was his name? Rick, was it? Rick. Yeah. Rick. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, yeah. But part of the uh, process of making the superhero stuff that I'm working on has been, you know, developing this franchise and, and having a narrative of, okay, why are we doing this? What are we trying to do? What's the manifesto of how we're trying to change the film industry or how we're trying to do things mm. in a more ethical or, 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 um, or inclusive way? way um and how are we being more financially and environmentally responsible um than a lot of major blockbusters are but whilst using people who work on all these major blockbusters and getting some a-list mm -hmm. stars involved and everything and hopefully making the film independently but then having it distributed by a major studio and within the uh, the theatrical scene um and the idea is hopefully to to set a good example because a lot of the systematic problems that i've found uh the higher I've gone up the ladder in the Hollywood industry, um, there's a lot of systematic problems which really have existed since the 1940s, 1950s and haven't really mm. changed because the people with the power 
to change them and the people who you know benefit from them staying the same um but that's not the way that reality works for the new younger generations coming up and who will be the new artists you know kids today are growing up you know shooting tiktoks and youtube videos and things and and they're editing their their own face for instagram and then they're editing together music videos they make with their friends and and people start making visual effects on after effects and uploading them to youtube and they look just as good as hollywood movies when they're yeah. on like a mobile phone um and i think I, obviously, because of my background, I'm very passionate about independent films. Um, but I do think that it, that the independent film market will grow as the skill set grows and as technology becomes cheaper, and as the internet and social media and Gen Z especially are very aware of making things fair and and doing things right, and they'll cancel people who who are who they believe to be bad um, and not want to support them. And the movie star is, as used to exist, just doesn't exist anymore. The un, the untouchable, mm -hmm. glamorous movie star, even the biggest A-list stars have to be showing their darkest times and posting selfies without makeup and doing live streams on Instagram from their home and showing you their dog, because that's what what the younger generations want. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not compatible with the Hollywood system as it exists at the moment, where they're spending, you know, 500 million making a movie, but they can't afford to pay their visual effects artists or they're bankrupting the LLCs so they don't have to pay back their debts. Or you end up with things like, you know, WB cancelling a load of their movies that they've already shot. And people yeah. go, well, why are they... Why they've spent 50 million making this movie. Why are they not releasing it? And the answer is no, they never spent that 50 million. It didn't exist in the first place. What happens was they wrote a load of blank checks for 50 million and they only have to pay back those blank checks if they release the film. If they write off the film, they can just cut that as debt and take it as a loss on a separately set up LLC or limited company. Um, no. And suddenly they haven't spent that 50 million after all. So when people are saying they've already made the film, why don't they just upload it to HBO Max? That's why, because it would cost them 50 million in order to do so. Um, no. That So th those kind of situations prove that the Hollywood system can't really continue to, to sustain itself and it's also not what what younger audiences want they want more and more and more content faster and faster they expect a high quality um but they don't necessarily care about a, a list untouchable movie stars or or and they don't see glamour in oh we've just splurged 500 million or a billion up, up the wall in fact they see it as wasteful because they're aware of what they and their friends could do if you gave them say a hundred thousand you know and yeah. they go, well, I could make that. Um, so, so the the book was always kind of being part written as a as a manifesto, and we've got a lot of it. the first film is being announced properly, and the first comic book based on it also at a, a big comic con uh, later on this year. Um, okay. And there was always going to be, at the very least, me putting out some form of whether it was in the form of a book or whether it was in the form of blog posts or, or a big long um, video that I made online, this is what I'm planning on doing and this is why, et cetera. Um, but then when I did that Reddit AMA and it got, you know, 3 million views and 35,000 likes and thousands of questions, um, it started occurring to me that the, just let the girl speak. Um, and also the, the, metaphor of of jinn trying to persuade the rebels as the way that they can take down the evil empire and, and save the universe mm -hmm. by doing the right thing um but also what's brilliant about rogue one is there are there are people on the rebel side who are actually doing the wrong thing and who are bad people and there are yeah. people on the empire side who are actually good people who are just being in a bad situation and that very much parallels what i'm saying about the film industry just because i might be saying oh there's corruption within hollywood or there's corruption within a certain studio or there was corruption within a certain movie set that doesn't mean that everybody who worked on it is evil and should never work again no 95 percent of the people are talented and brilliant and they're just trapped in in a broken system um right. so all of those parallels to Together made me very much think oh I could add a Star Wars element to that and then people started reaching out to me and actually yes I, I was approached by a publisher who said we can do this and we can put it on Amazon we can put it on Kindle we can do an audiobook um, so the Kickstarter doesn't really the Kickstarter that we'll be putting up is not really um, 
whether the book's going to exist or not. And it's only asking for 500 pounds in the first place, which is what, you know, six, seven hundred dollars. So it's not trying to raise a lot of money. Um, what that is trying to do is to essentially fund a limited edition first print run for Star Wars fans because it's got right. a vaguely Star Wars-esque um, cover, even though non-copywriting. Mm -hmm. um, right. And I can sign copies for people because people are always asking me, Star Wars fans are always asking me for an autograph or asking me for whatever. And I always feel a bit weird about doing that because A, I don't think I'm famous and B, I'm not entirely sure that Disney would want me, you know, putting myself out there as an ambassador for their brand right. um, in an unofficial way. So because so many people within that Reddit thread were asking me, can I get an autograph or can I get a whatever? I just thought, let's put out a limited edition print run of paperback and hardback books that will have a slightly more Star Wars themed cover. Um, <laughs> like the just let the girl speak is in the Star Wars font and it's got the, the two moons in the, in the, in the background of, of the image. Um, and you know, I can autograph it for them and write, just let the girl speak or whatever. Or, or um, yeah. And also it allows me, people can add on if they want to buy an autographed picture or if they want me to do like a cameo style video telling their husband to just let the girl speak or whatever, they can add that on as, you know, pay 10, <laughs> 10 pounds and get a video or whatever. Um, and it's just like a fun little thing. And again, it's not for profit. All of that money will yeah. be going. Kickstarter doesn't allow you to do charity um, uh, listings. Um, you'd have to put it on a different website for that. But all of the money will go towards films or positions within my superhero set of movies, which will be specifically hiring women and underrepresented minorities. It's none of it is going to me. That's great. That's Sorry, that was a very great. long answer to a question. Yeah. I'm aware of it. Well, I mean, one of the things that I do like about the Disney era and some people uh, may not like it and be incredibly vocal about it mm. is the inclusion of people yeah. of color and and and, and women lead characters because yeah. the original trilogy, which I lived, I, I'm 46. I've yeah. been around the entire time Star Wars has been around, and for the longest time, it was always there's no girls in Star Wars. They're just Princess Leia, and then you oh. have like Mon Mothma, and yeah, you have, and you have like. It, it, there's, but there's... but I'm talking the original trilogy, okay. like me growing up. Yeah. Um, because I mean, uh, episode one came out when I was 21 or something. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, so my, my entire like sort of childhood growing up, it was always like, there's no girls in Star Wars. Um, there's like well, the, three, Leia, three main Leia, characters, Leia, Baru and, and Mon Mothma. Yeah. But, really but Leia was a very ones. progressive character for the, yeah. for the seventies. I mean, yeah. you could argue that George Lucas yeah. messed that up with, uh, with, with Return of the Jedi and the whole not letting her wear underwear because they don't have underwear in space and, and weird right. things like that. Um, but, uh, and again, I'm not making a comment on George Lucas. That was just off the time and whatever was happening. And, and, yeah. and Carrie is, tells those stories way better or told those stories way better than me. It, it the the Disney air has been terrific though. The Disney air has been yeah. terrific. I love Ray. I love Jyn Erso. Um, yeah. Uh, you look at like uh, the Mandalorian, the finale of season two of Mandalorian. It's uh, yeah. it's uh, the Mandalorian is flying in a ship to meet mm -hmm. again Luke Skywalker of all people in a ship full of strong female characters. So it's it's really nice that this like your your line will always be in a Star Wars movie. Yeah, and it's a great it's a it's a great sort of statement for yeah. the state of Star Wars now. Yeah. Um, uh, because of all the strong female characters that we're getting, I, um, I agree. I, I think I, like um, I, I think it's important because I mean, as you can probably tell, I'm pretty much very left wing and liberal and, and progressive. Um, yeah. But there is a problem recently with a lot of, uh, and as I said, lots of uh, friends and family and everything in the trans communities and, and everything else. But yeah. but when when I say words like gender politics or or you know I, i'm not i'm not uh singling out anything and saying it's negative um but there's a danger on both the left and the right at the moment of people taking things to too far of an extremes and seeing each other as other and hating each other and people on the far left just going that person disagrees with me therefore they are evil i'm going to call them a nazi i'm going to harass them or dox them or i'm mm -hmm. going to set all my fans against them we're going to 
kill this person's career. Whereas actually what they should be doing is going, no, we're going to explain to them why they're wrong. And even if they've got a really problematic view, we're going to feel very sorry for the fact that they've got that problematic view. Where did they get that from? Is it something in their upbringing? Is it something in their childhood? Has they been given the wrong information? Has something hurt them? Can we can we make friends with these people and help meet in the middle? And people on the right, it's exactly the same problem. Um, people demon, like people like leftists and progressives like myself quite often demonize people on the right. I'll say, oh, if you watch Fox News, you must be evil. If you voted for Trump, <laughs> you must be evil. That's patently right. not true. I know many yeah. people who, uh, mm -hmm. who are more conservative and are wonderful people. In fact, ironically, I know people who literally are uh, members of the Conservative Party in the UK who are trans and who are, you know, all kinds of minorities. Um, and I know people oh. within the uh, within the, the uh, you know, people of color in, in, in America, because I, I, I a lot a lot of my colleagues in America are, are uh, people of color um, because uh, I started off in the music industry and I was predominantly working as a ghostwriter for rappers and, and R&B artists. So I worked with a lot okay. of multi-platinum big black celebrities and toured black areas and, and hung around in, in Detroit and hung around it, you know, in, in and Brooklyn and in, um, South Central. Um, so I, I would never claim to speak for those communities, um, yeah. but I do know a lot of people within those communities who are on the right or who are conservative or who did vote for Trump. And I believe that they're misinformed, but I understand why they did. And it's because they feel that the the, the left and the progressive side of things has gone too far and is being fiscally irresponsible mm -hmm. or is saying things that to them sound crazy. Like, what do you mean that there's more than two genders or what do you mean that there's, you know, and because they don't understand um, because naturally humans fear what they don't understand or uh, and they fear change. They want things to stay the same because yeah. that's comfortable. You can end up with well, the left and the right hating each other. So so Star Wars, um, I think Disney Star Wars has been pretty good um, yeah. at, at representation. But what has sometimes triggered people um, into complaining um, and people would say, oh, no, you're being toxic by saying that you don't like rose or yeah. you don't think there should be a black stormtrooper or you think there's or you think that ray is a mary sue which i mean arguably she is verging on it she's a little bit too powerful in my opinion but, but she, is, should have, but, she should have been more like luke and i mean but her genes her her, her her genes are but, really strong with the force yeah I now mean, i love ray uh, I, I i love ray i'm just playing devil's advocate and saying yeah, there yeah. are legitimate reasons to say that the character of rose mm -hmm. didn't need to be there in in last jedi i think she's great mm -hmm. i think the actress did a fantastic job but it's almost like a detour that didn't need to be there and and slows down the yeah. plot and and so therefore it's very easy to give the argument oh well she was only put in there for representation or to sell to markets in a different country um and i th i think many of the people who argue against say well especially ray but also other female characters when the within the uh modern star wars universe those same people that people will say oh you're being sexist no they, they, those same people are fans of say the aliens movies and are yeah. fans of uh, sigourney weaver and ghostbusters or a fan you know um there are plenty of um or you know love the tomb raider games or whatever you know it's not that they're against female characters it's they're against what they feel is kind of tokenism or, or casting just for the sake of that mm -hmm. or um so kind of hollywood corporate wokeism just to get just to make profit just to appeal to the kind mm -hmm. of rainbow generation but i personally don't agree with that i think that although there are some changes i would have made overall i think disney has, has done an absolutely uh, absolutely fantastic job i feel like when you were talking about liberals and conservatives and stuff and people yeah. arguing yeah. on on both sides um you watch rogue one you watch this scene specifically yeah. and here's a room of good guys these are the good guys these are mm -hmm. this is the rebellion yeah. uh for me growing up i never cared for the bad guys i was always sure. number one rebel fan and here is yeah. a group of rebels these are the good guys yeah. and they're arguing yeah and they're talking about diplomacy and all of this bullshit and it's like no and some of them don't want There's to believe her because she's here. poor some of them don't want to but, believe her because she's low yeah. status some people don't want to believe her because she's female some she's people don't want to military. believe her because she she's young a, she's not yeah. military yeah there's all these all and, these but, unconscious biases within the good guys she's the only one that's, that's fighting for action yeah like you can writing. argue this shit all the time yeah and 
Yeah. I mean, it's 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 one of those things where it's like action. That's the only thing that's going to change anything is action. And yeah. you can have these debates on all of this bullshit until you're blue in the face. But yeah. it, it, when it comes down to it, let's let's have the people who want to do action that's in exactly the fold it. and at that, the that's forefront. Exactly it. And yeah. I mean, we're I mean, sure, your character is sort of a linchpin to her being able to speak and ultimately to mm -hmm. taking out the Death Star, which leads to taking out the Empire. <laughs> but yeah. First Order came back. But it's one of those things where it's like the thing that I like about it. And you're, yes, your character is important. <laughs> but the thing I like about it is when you have a galaxy wide threat, yeah, it can come down to one voice. Uh, yeah, in that yeah. moment, you were the one voice, and then of course, well, Jenna very briefly, be, but it's mostly, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then it, but that one little voice allowed a bigger voice to come in, and then a bigger one, and then yeah. things sort of yeah. snowball. So yeah. it does, it is important to listen to uh, the little guy, yeah, uh, you know, doesn't matter. If they're just a pilot, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. If they're just a, uh, you know, a, a, a daughter of a farmer, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, everyone should have a voice. And I think that um, uh, you sort of representing that and bringing that. It is just one line that you did in an ADR room, but <laughs> it's it, it, it. everything can be important. And everybody knows in Star Wars, mm -hmm. any side character can be important. And yeah. I feel like... Um, uh having you're our first rebel pilot to be on our show and right. it is amazing um uh, it's an experience i probably will never have uh wearing a rebel flight suit mm. um and i gotta be honest with you i kind of dig the blue suits more than the orange ones even though i grew up with the orange Just ones saying. i think the blue ones look kind of cool i mean i'm i'm pasty as heck and i tend to go very kind of red and you know so uh, yeah the blue suits my uh, skin tone a lot better <laughs> did you get any did you get any like production shots of your character are there any yeah, like trading card yeah. things and stuff oh yeah yeah that's, absolutely oh, um there's there's loads way way better pictures than what actually made it in into the finished movie there's uh loads of uh yeah, loads of proper production stuff. I, I've been in in various uh, official books and trading cards, and uh, obviously online stuff like the Wikipedia and and, and all all of the other um, things uh, similar to that. And I'm just uh, and people send me stuff. Um, I get sent stuff from around the world. Of hey, I was in Germany and I saw this, or hey, I yeah. was in Japan and I picked this up for you. And I'm just so grateful, and it, it blows my mind. And randomly, I see myself appearing on on different news websites and things that none of them ever think to tell me i quite often i mean that's you none you of them ever be out reach there. out to me and ask ask to speak to me it's uh, whenever anybody does you know i've had multiple podcasts and things and i'm always insanely grateful um and i'm very grateful to you guys because by the way i've listened to multiple episodes of yours and i love what you're doing i think it's really good <laughs> how you're covering more obscure stuff like uh recently yeah. you know you covered like um uh, Rebel Assault uh, 2 and I grew, yeah. I loved those games when I was growing up and and the Conan O'Brien thing I, I actually am a massive fan of Conan O'Brien and, and we're actually mm, we're hoping to get him in in our superhero movie being being a, a very brief cameo and things because I'm just such a big fan of him and his yeah, team well, um, yeah he's he's a great guy and again you, he's um... just on the right side of history as far as doing things right in the industry and being a good guy and being a good voice so right right um yeah getting your name out there uh, uh would would be great especially with season two of andor coming up um yeah i hope so fingers crossed fingers crossed for you um well you, you I, you I, I mean if any sorry if, if anyone from disney is watching i am not assuming under any circumstance this isn't a big play to <laughs> try and is... get into andor this is everybody else keeps bringing it up i had about a hundred people at least comment that I should be in Andorra. And I'm like, every, every time I try and answer diplomatically, I'm like, obviously I would love that. Even I if it's the same a, capacity. A chance. It's like nothing. Let me ask you, let me ask you this because you said you did shoot stuff and then um, you were, your, it was cut out. your stuff was cut down. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever get to shoot stuff in an X-Wing? Um, I mean, can I you say I, or can you I not say? have. I mean, I, I'm not supposed. To, I'm not supposed to say, but uh, technically, my uh, helmet that you see me carrying. So you know, because my my NDA allows me to say what is public information, and so public information is anything that's been used in official pictures or or that's in the movie. So 
in my in my pictures and in the film, I'm carrying a Y wing uh, helmet um, rather than an X wing helmet, and also it has a oh. cracked it has a cracked visor. Um, so that might tell oh. you something. Um, that I feel I, like, and yes, I have sat I mean... in various different cockpits. I've actually also set foot on the Millennium Falcon, which obviously has nothing to do with um, no. uh, with Rogue, Rogue One. One. But I just happened to be there in Pinewood at the time when it was there, and somebody Last let Jedi, me on. Probably, yeah. The uh, the me I mean, because it... you've seen the footage in all the documentaries of mm -hmm. um, I forget the name General Merrick uh, sitting in the leader of blue squadron getting yeah. him in his, his x-wing for the first time and yeah, there's yeah, that yeah, shot yeah. of him and it's just yeah, pure yeah. joy like uh, i can't imagine um uh, if you got that opportunity i'm sure it would have been completely surreal and life-changing yeah. you don't have to say i'm gonna my imagination is saying that i mean why would they make you a helmet unless you were going to be uh -huh. in the, you know because i don't remember you holding the helmet in the briefing room. So I'm going to say that that helmet oh, yeah. was for, for something else that okay. was shot. And mm -hmm. that sounds amazing. And okay. my favorite rebel ship is a Y wing ship. And if you happen to oh, be okay. a, -wing, yeah. uh -huh. a, a Y wing cockpit, mm -hmm. I mean, Holy cow. That, I mean, that would be amazing. And also I would have, I mean, this is all me speculating. Mm -hmm. um, you have said nothing. I'm not allowed to say anything, have, but yeah, you haven't, yep. you haven't mm -hmm. um, acknowledged that anything I said is sure. fact or not true or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the idea of Blue Squadron not just being all X wings, but also having Y wings, mm -hmm. now seriously <laughs> makes them my favorite yeah. uh, squadron. Um, and of course, having and of course like having X -wings. a U wing, of course having a U wing to deliver extra foot soldiers as well. So yeah. It, it, it so, was a, a fairly big, um, or it could have been a, a fairly big battalion, you know. Because, <laughs> because I mean, because I mean, Red Squadron is cool, but they're all X wings, yeah. and I was like, that's cool. But I really like, I really like Y wings, and I really like mm -hmm. B wings too, and A wing. Like, I like all the Rebel ships. Yeah. But if there's a, if there's a Blue Squadron, have like more than just X wings, man. That's that, that'd well, be pretty cool. Yeah, I I, I wouldn't be allowed um, to speculate, but that would be really cool. Yeah, <laughs> I think it would also be fun is if um if Andor gets close to Rogue One, where we do see maybe alternate versions of the Battle mm -hmm. of Scarif. Yeah. Um, we know Gareth shot some other stuff, uh, yeah. and uh, that stuff was truncated. Um, maybe it'll show up the same way that gold leader and red leader showed up in rogue one used using archival footage. Yeah. Um, I, it, well, what, that's, that's what, true. What they, would they, that if be? They've got, if, if, if they've kept the footage, they could use it. They could put it in and I wouldn't even be told until I'm watching the show. And then it just suddenly I'm there, you know, what would that do? What would that do to your brain? If all of a sudden you're yeah. in a scene, I'd, I'd probably yeah, faint. That's... I'd probably pass out. Um, yeah, no, that that would be incredible. Right. I I don't think that's likely because it's all being shot on on different different cameras and and with different. Right. Uh, but but I mean, it, like you say, archival. It could X wing shots. Hey, if they can stick nineteen seventy six footage in yeah. a what two thousand sixteen film was it? Sure, yeah. two thousand sixteen, I believe. It was shot in um, twenty fifteen. I think it came out December twenty fifteen. Yeah. So just but all that X, the, the, the gold leader and red leader in that were shot yeah. in 76. Yeah. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like, Hey, if they're going to put that in, like, let's, let's, yeah. let's the presidents has been set. Well, so. I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to tempt fate. No. And also I don't no. want people to assume that I think I'm important enough for this, that to happen because I right, absolutely don't. Right. But if it did happen, I would just, yeah. I, I'd this just is me. <laughs> this is me just being a fanboy living vicariously through you. Um, mm -hmm. I've done uh, fast food work as well. Um, so uh, imagining the fact that you were able to get into that flight suit and and live mm -hmm. out your fantasy of being in the yeah. Rebel Alliance, like, I don't know, maybe there's hope for me. I guess that's the of whole course. thing this, this movie hope. hinges on is on hope. Up. So <laughs> I just want to say, first of all, thank you for joining me. Uh, your, your story... Um, is exciting for me because it is about the little guy. You are the little guy. You yeah. are the guy who's, who, who adds that little extra spark to shut all the bureaucrats up so that the girl can speak um, yeah. and, and, and start the rebellion uh, proper. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the book. Um, we Thank don't, you. you don't have a clicks 
Kickstarter link yet. Yeah, I, I but, can. I've, um, I've got the link. I can send you the link. Um, but it's not gone live yet because Kickstarter have to approve processes, and I guess something yeah, flagged it up yeah. as you know maybe a copyright or something. So it should be going so live we'll, in the next few days. People can follow me on on Twitter um, at Samuel Victor S A M U E L V I C T O R. And as soon as the links up, I'll, I'll I'll be you know tweeting about it, and also of course I'll be tweeting out links to this this podcast and yeah. the Reddit and everything else that people might find yeah. interesting, and the superhero yeah. stuff well, when that happens. Yeah, and we'll make sure that we uh, we pass that info along. And yeah, uh, when we, as soon as we get that link, uh, go in the show description below on YouTube, and I'll make sure to include that link. Uh, once I'll send it before. as soon as we hang up. I'll I'll send it across. But but that doesn't mean that the link is live yet. It might take a few days to go up. So, okay, sounds good. Um, congratulations on everything. Thank good luck so with much. the the superhero film. Um, yeah. Again, send us information as soon as you get it. We can we can uh, update our uh, our uh, description below with all of that stuff. And Thank congratulations you. on that. And uh, good luck with the VFX. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, have fun. Keep doing that. I've been doing some some things. Uh, definitely not anything remotely you know as good as the the uh um <laughs> the black widow shot like i'm not <laughs> i'm just doing stuff for the show but it's it's a terribly uh difficult thing to learn and um and good luck on that and it, it's hopefully... difficult and it's time consuming to learn but yeah. nowadays the barrier to entry is much lower than anything else even yeah. even a basic gaming pc or, or gaming laptop can do it and the software is basically free or affordable and there are there are youtube tutorials and everything that you can follow so it's it really has democratized and decentralized the Hollywood system and meant that what would have used to have cost tens of thousands of dollars to produce can now be done for free in your bedroom if you're talented enough and if you're willing to spend months and months and months learning and practicing you know and and I think that is the future of the industry is passionate people who actually care about the art and care about making something really good and just want to earn a living doing that and yeah. it's not just a handful of super rich people <laughs> who won the lottery that can somehow do it you know yeah well, good luck. Congratulations. Thank Thanks for coming on. Uh, you're welcome to join us anytime to talk well, about Star Wars. Thank you so Wars. much for having me. Thank um, you. And, uh, and yeah, I just want to thank everybody who joined us live in the chat. And yeah, uh, <laughs> everybody knows where to find us at Live Action SW everywhere. And since James is here, I'll do the entire outro and then we'll be off. Uh, so this is uh, Ralph saying, don't give in to hate, celebrate the love. Yes. Bye. Love it.